Hello everybody, a warm welcome to you from Hermanus. It's a, it's a glorious morning here. Believe me, there are a uh, few more pleasant experiences than Hermanus on a warm, sunny winter's day. We greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Being out here in the open air, uh, one is reminded of that great question that God asks in Isaiah chapter 40. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Lord? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all this? He who brings the starry hosts out one by one and calls them each by name. Because of his great power and might, not one of them is missing. So why do you complain, O Israel, and say, O Jacob, my cause is disregarded by my God? Have you not seen, have you not heard that the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? His understanding no one can fathom. He gives power to the weary and increases the strength of the weak. Even youths grow weak and young men stumble and fall. But those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. A wonderful, wonderful passage is that. And it leads us into our opening hymn, which this morning comes to us from Westminster Abbey, the great hymn, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of Creation. Thrilling singing of a great hymn. I love the last verse when the whole congregation joins together and the singing reaches a climax. Um, Praise to the Lord, oh, let all that is in me adore him. All that has life and breath come now with praises before him. Let thee, amen, sound from his people again. Gladly for a we adore him. Let us pray together. Loving God, we thank you for this day that you have given to us. What a privilege and a joy it is to be alive, to, to breathe this fresh air, to be surrounded by such beauty. You are the Creator God, and you have given us this that we see to enjoy and to embrace and to appreciate it. We thank you that it helps us to know you better. Thank you not only for your book, the Bible, but for your book, Creation, wherein you speak to us and teach so many life lessons to us. Thank you for the gift of our Lord Jesus Christ. In him is life, and that life is the light of men and women. 
And we pray that we might enter more deeply into his new life. We thank you for his presence with us. And we ask, Lord, that our lives might be filled daily with a deep sense of wonder and gratitude for all that you have done and continue to do for us. Hear us now as we share together in the prayer, the Lord's Prayer, that you taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
I would like to read a few verses, well-known verses, that St. Paul wrote to the Christians in Rome. Uh, in Romans chapter 8, uh, you will recognize these words when we recall Paul saying, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. And then he goes on. What shall we say? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, give us graciously all things? And then he goes on, right at the end of Romans chapter 8, does Paul, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or the sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons nor the present nor the future nor any powers neither height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. From Paul's letter to the Romans, let me switch into the New Testament to what is undoubtedly my favorite story uh, in the Old Testament, and that is the story of Joseph. Now, if ever there was a young guy whose life turned out not unlike a, a game of snakes and ladders, it's Joseph. Um, he was the beloved son of his father Jacob and his mother Rachel. Uh, he had ten other brothers, but there was no doubt in Jacob's mind as to who his favorite boy was, and that was Joseph. And Joseph was a very talented, gifted guy. He's the sort of guy that had a great future. Um, he was a dreamer. And you remember he once had that dream wherein he saw the, the, the sheaves of wheat bowing down to other sheaves of wheat. And he said this was a, a, a prophecy almost that one day uh, he, Joseph, would see his brothers bowing down to him. Well, that didn't go down well at all. The long and the short of it is that his brothers hated him. Um, and there was that terrible moment in Joseph's life when the jealousy in his brother's hearts burned so deeply that in a, in a moment of complete madness and appalling cruelty, they sold their brother into slavery to a, a band of Midianites that were going down to Egypt. And therein lies the first snake in, in Joseph's life. Um, snakes and ladders, do you know that game? Uh, it's a good game to play with your grandchildren, by the way. You have a little counter and you throw a dice and you get five and you go one, two, three, four, five. And there are ladders and there are snakes. And if you hit the bottom of the ladder, you go up and then you make progress and you grow and you think this is great and then suddenly you hit a snake and you you go down to to where you first began well there were lots of snakes and ladders in joseph's life i mean looking at it face value he's the sort of guy that should only have had ladders up and up and up and up he should have got better and better and better well it's not like that in life is it we have our ladders, we have our triumphs, and then we have our disappointments, sometimes tragedies. And we have to get used to the fact that life is full of ladders and snakes, ups and some enormous downs. And we have to have the wherewithal within us to be able to give thanks when we're on a ladder and to trust God when we slither down and we find life has become a huge, huge challenge. Well, the first snake that Joseph encountered was when his brothers sent him into slavery. It was a humiliation for this boy with so much dignity and talent and self-respect to land up being a slave 
in Egypt. He in fact was a slave in the home of Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's uh, uh, captains of the guard. And there in Potiphar's household, Joseph did what was right. He could have been embittered, he could have said this is hopeless, but he resolved to be the very best that he could be. And we read over and over again in that story, Genesis 37 to Genesis 46, that the Lord was with Joseph. And Joseph resolved to be the very best that he could be in Potiphar's household. And Potiphar trusted him. And the more he trusted him, the more he entrusted things and responsibilities to this young Joseph. He was a young guy on the up, despite the fact that he was in a situation that was not his first choice. And he's on a ladder, going up, 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 and then the snake comes in. And this time the snake, in the form of Potiphar's wife, we're told Joseph was handsome and well-built, and his wife Potiphar's wife rather noticed that and there is that attempted seduction where Joseph acts absolutely impeccably and says no this is wrong I will not do it this is to sin against your husband it is to sin against God I will not do it but you know how Potiphar's wife is 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 offended that this young guy scorns her advances and she lays false charges of rape against Joseph. That's the snake and down he goes because he lands up in dungeons, he lands up in prison. Snakes and ladders, it's the same as I said for all of us but it must have been particularly difficult for Joseph because he is a man who is a dreamer, who had, who had so much in his mind and in his heart for the future. But what happens even in the dungeon? We read, the Lord was with Joseph. And far from disintegrating, far from deciding that life was not worth living and giving up, he's a man, a young man who resolves that he's going to be the very best, even in that dungeon. And in that dungeon, the captain of the guards of the prisons commits to Joseph more and more responsibilities. And he's just that sort of guy. He has a mindset that says, I don't want to be here, but I am here. You know, in golf we say, you've got to play the ball as it lies. Well, Joseph had to play the ball as it lies and be the very best in those circumstances. And the captain of the guard gave him more and more responsibilities. And he was respected by other prisoners. And then you remember, there was a cupbearer and a baker who worked in Pharaoh's palace. They landed up in prison and they had dreams. And they came to Joseph and they said, can you help us to interpret the dreams? And Joseph said, I can't interpret the dreams, but God will help me to interpret your dreams. And he interprets the dreams, and it's a good dream for one, and it's not such a good dream for the other. And the cupbearer is released out of prison, but before he is released, Joseph says, please, please remember me to Pharaoh, because I'm here for something I did not do. Well, the cupbearer went back to Pharaoh's palace and promptly forgot about Joseph. So he hits another snake and for two further years he languished in prison. It's life, snakes and ladders. That's the small print. It happened even to Christians, even those who profess faith in the Lord. It happened to Paul. You remember how he lands up in prison and he writes to the Philippians and he says, you know, this is not necessarily the place I want to be, but this is where I am and I am going to make the most of it. And because I'm here, the Word of God has gone to places which otherwise it might never ever have reached. I like that mindset of Paul and I like 
the mindset of Joseph. I mean, imagine there in prison, dungeon, forgotten. We're not talking about just a, 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 a mild prison. We're talking of the most appalling circumstances. And we're reading, the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. You remember the song of Fantine from, from Les Miserables. I, I dreamed a dream in times gone by when hope was high and life worth living. I dreamed that love would never die. I dreamed that God would be forgiving. Um, then I was young and unafraid when dreams were made and used and wasted. So, so, well, I forget how all the words go, uh, but right on at the end of that song, she said, now I had a dream my life would be so different from this hell I'm living, so different now from what it seemed. Now life has killed the dream I dreamed. Life has killed the dream I dreamed. That could have been Joseph's song, but it wasn't. He was upset by all those disappointments, but there was something within him, despite the great sadness and the huge disappointment that kept him steady. He was a boy who was anchored. And despite these circumstances of immense difficulty, he was committed to doing what was right. He was never going to throw in the towel because he understood that God was with him. Well, you know the story of what happened thereafter. Um, two years later, that cupbearer who'd gone back to the palace of Pharaoh suddenly remembers that there was this guy in prison who helped him to interpret his dream. Pharaoh had had a dream, and Pharaoh was troubled by this dream. And this guy said, hang on a moment, your highness. There is this guy. And Joseph is sent for, and he comes up, and he ha helps Pharaoh to understand his dream. And now from nowhere, suddenly Joseph is on a ladder. It seems for a while the snakes have gone. And he's on a ladder. And he's up, and he's up, and he's up. And not only is he just up, he reaches a position in Egypt because of his wisdom, because of his excellence, because of his reliability and his loyalty. He becomes the number two figure in the great empire of Egypt. Now that's not a bad outcome for a boy who started off in the very humble tents and abode of his father and mother, Jacob and Rachel, who sold as a slave into Egypt. It's pretty impressive. So there was something underlying this lad. And I say to you, it was a faith and a trust in God and a courage and a refusal to throw in the towel. Here was a young man who understood that he had gifts, that there was something that he could do even though his personal circumstances were hugely against him. He had the courage, because he trusted in God, to say yes to life. Never forget that. Say yes to life. God knows you. God loves you. And God has given himself for you. If God be for us, who can be against us? says St. Paul. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. It may not be immediately apparent, but we have to take a long perspective. I think the older we get, as we look back on our lives, and all the stumblings, and all the, the, the poor decisions perhaps, we can, however, discern a leading and a guidance of God. God was with Joseph, God was with Paul, and God is with you. Well, there came a day of reckoning in Joseph's life. You remember, he's the number two in Egypt. And one day, 
his brothers arrive. They don't know that Joseph is still alive. They don't know what's happened to Joseph. It had troubled them. I think they had suffered from uh, very guilty consciences, but there was nothing they could do, although it was churning within them. They came to look for food. There was a famine in the land, and they are led into Joseph's company, who immediately recognizes them. Now, you place yourself in that situation. Somebody has wronged you. Somebody has set your life back your life back so severely and now you are with them you are in their presence what do you do what do you do it was a tough one for joseph and perhaps understandably understandably for a while he he kind of is quite difficult with them he's not just going to say oh guys don't worry morisal alles rechtkomm it's all okay. It's understandable that for a while, with this thing that had been done to him, that all these memories, and they were very painful memories, came flooding back to them. And he didn't go and embrace them. He actually, at times, was seemingly quite cruel to them and tormented them. It's a very human story, as this one of Joseph. Yes, God was with him, and, 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 and there's no doubt about that. But there's a human side with Joseph that it seems that he's always wrestling with. And, and he's trying to be the very best that he can be. But there is this thing that sticks in his throat, that he was sold as a slave, he was humiliated, he was treated cruelly by his own siblings. And what is he going to do? What is he going to do with these people who are now standing in front of them? Um, I'm sure you, you've been in that kind of situation when people have wronged you, and there they are in front of you. Uh, Joseph, Joseph, whether he played it correctly is, is debatable, but the fact remains that Joseph is in a situation here that he is not finding easy and he has to somehow deal with it. Well, you know the comings and the goings, how Joseph says to these men, listen, you go back and you call your, get your young brother Benjamin back here in Egypt. Now, Benjamin was the youngest. He was inseparable with his father. And the father didn't want Benjamin to go to Israel, but Joseph insisted that his brother, his little brother, be brought back to Egypt. The brothers are horrified. Simeon is taken captive as a sort of a guarantee that they will bring Benjamin back. Uh, it wasn't a pleasant situation. The, the brothers go back to Jacob and they say to him, listen, that ruler in Egypt has told us that we must bring Benjamin back. Jacob almost has heart failure. To cut a long story short, Benjamin is brought down. And there takes place this, this hugely emotional moment where Joseph sees his little brother. It's his little full brother. All the other brothers are half-brothers. This is Rachel's son. This is Jacob's beloved Benjamin. And just as Joseph was Rachel's son and his father was Jacob, Joseph is looking at Benjamin. And, uh, and then he turns away, leaves the room and begins to cry. And then he returns. And again, the story goes on. You should read it for yourself. But there comes a time, there comes a time when Joseph looks at his brothers and he can no longer hold it. He can no longer contain it. He looks at his brothers, and Judah in particular, who had confronted him and said, I am Joseph. I am Joseph. And it seems as if all the pent-up frustration and hurts of, of the years suddenly come flooding out of Joseph's heart and of his eyes. And he goes around and he says, come near to me, come near to me. 
and he embraces them. It is a, a marvelous moment of, of forgiveness, a moment of, of unsurpassed reconciliation as Joseph finally comes to terms with what has been done to him. Um, it's a powerful story. Snakes and ladders. And it raises a question for me, as probably it might raise a question for you. In this life, with all that sometimes goes well and sometimes goes badly and often does go badly, when we've got things that have happened to us that weigh us down and keep us from being the people that God wants us to be, how then should we react? And I want to suggest that the way to react is to make our foundation strong again and to make sure that the three principles of life are deeply entrenched. And those three principles, three realities that I think I find in, in Joseph, and they are the reality of faith and hope and love. Faith that there is a God who loves you, that there is absolutely nothing that can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8. Take that on board. Faith in a God who loves you. Hope in a God who can use the circumstances of your life, sometimes hugely challenging, the setbacks, the tragedies, the tears, that God can take those things and yet make a life for you. That your life is not all about slithering down the snakes on that game board. But there is faith, a God who loves you, a hope that there is a God who has a plan and a purpose for you, and that He will bring it to pass. And most of all, love that enables you to love God and love people who may even have hurt you in the past and to be able to take your life forward with faith and hope and love. I've spoken too long. Sorry about that. But the point of the story of Joseph is that here is a man for whom all things did work together for good who persevered through all the tough setbacks that he had to endure. May God give you courage. May God help you to say yes to life, precisely because you know him and that his calling is upon you. So we're going to have a short prayer. Dear Lord, thank you that our times are in your hands. Help us to trust you, especially when we are not always able to see the horizon. Help us to live with faith and hope and love. Watch over this town, watch over our families, and we ask you, Lord, that your blessing may be upon them. In Jesus' name.
Well, friends, it's been great being with you here at, uh, at the front of Hermanus, uh, one of my favorite places. Uh, it's, it's terrific. God be with you, and we close off with a, a blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Amen. Amen.